Shoscombe Old Place by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dramatised by Grant Eustace, with Roy Marsden as Sherlock Holmes and John Moffat as Dr. Watson. Uh, it's Clue, Watson. It's unquestionably Clue. Sherlock Holmes had been bending for a long time over a microscope. Now he had straightened up and looked round at me in triumph. Well, look through the eyepiece for yourself. <laughs> Those hairs are threads from a tweed coat. Yeah. The irregular grey masses, are, uh, they're dust. Those brown blobs in the centre are glue. Oh. Huh. Well, uh, I'm prepared to take your word for it. <laughs> does, uh, does anything depend on it? You may remember in the St Pancras case that a cap was found beside the dead policeman. Mm. The accused man denies it is but he is a picture frame maker who habitually handles glue. Mm. Is it one of your cases? No, no. Mary Vale of the Yard asked me to look into it. Since I ran down that coin about the zinc and copper filings in the seam of his cuff, they may have begun to realise the importance of the microscope. Mm. Uh, didn't you say earlier that you had a client calling? Yes. Oh, he's over the By the way, Watson, do you know something of racing? Oh, well, I ought to. I pay for it with about half my wound pension. <laughs> Well, then I'll make you my guide to the turf. Huh. Does the name Sir Robert Norverton recall anything to you? Oh, I should say so. Lives at Shoscombe Old Place, which I know because my summer quarters were near there once. And uh, he nearly came within your province on one occasion. Oh, how was that? It was when he horsewhipped a moneylender on Newmarket Heath. He nearly killed the man. Ah, well, he sounds interesting. Does he often indulge in that way? Well, he has the name of being a dangerous man... He's about the most daredevil rider in England, second in the Grand National a few years back. So, he should have been a buck in the days of the Regency. <laughs> and he's always had an eye for fair ladies and for an argument. And by all accounts, he's so deep in debt that he may never get out of it again. A capital sketch, Watson. I seem to know the man already. Now, can you give me some idea of Shoscombe Old Place? Um... No, only that it's in the centre of Shoscombe Park and that the famous Shoscombe Stud and Training Quarters are to be found there. And the head trainer is John Mason. What? Oh, well, you need not look surprised at my knowledge since I have a letter here from him. Oh. Uh, but go on, I seem to have struck a rich vein. Uh, well, there are the Shoscombe Spaniels, the most exclusive breed in England. They're the special pride of the lady of Shoscombe Old Place. Norberton's wife? No, no, no. Sir Robert has never married. And just as well, I think, considering his prospects... No, he lives with his widowed sister, Lady Beatrice Polder. You mean that she lives with him? No, no, the place belonged to her late husband. Norberton has no claim at all. It's only a life interest and reverts to her husband's brother. Now, meanwhile, she draws the rents every year. And I suppose Brother Robert then spends the said rents? Uh, that's about the size of it. He must lead her a most uneasy life. Although it's said she's devoted to him. But, uh... What is amiss, Sir Chosman? Oh, oh, I think I hear at last the person who can tell us. Oh, the man who was shown in had the firm, austere expression only seen upon those who have to control horses or boys. Mr. John Mason had many of both under his sway, and he looked equal to the task. You had my note, Mr. Holmes. Yes, but it explained nothing. It was too delicate a thing to put the details on paper. Well, we are at your disposal. First of all, I think Sir Robert has gone mad. Hmm? Well, this is Baker Street, Mr. Mason, not Harley Street. Oh. But why do you say so? When a man does one strange thing, sir, or two, there may be a meaning to it. But when everything he does is strange, you begin to wonder. I believe the Derby has turned his brain. You are running a horse? Shoscombe Prince, the best in England. Who? Oh. But uh, I'll be plain with you, for I know it won't go beyond this room. Sir Robert has got to win this derby. Everything he could raise or borrow is on the horse, and at fine odds. You can get forties now, but it was nearer a hundred. Oh, but how is that, if the horse is so good? The public don't know how good he is. Sir Robert has the prince's half-brother out for runs. Oh. You can't tell him apart mm. until you see them gallop. But if the prince fails him, Sir Robert is done. It seems a rather desperate gamble, but where does the madness come in? You only have to look at him. Down at the stables at all hours, his eyes wild. Then there is his conduct to Lady Beatrice. Ah, what is that? 
They have always been the best of friends, and she loved the horses as much as he did. Every day at the same hour, she would drive down to see them. But that's all over now. Why? She seems to have lost all interest. For a week now, she has driven past the stables with never so much as a good morning. You think there has been a quarrel? And a savage one at that. Why else would he give away her favourite spaniel to old Barnes, what keeps the green dragon? Mm, that certainly does seem odd. Of course, sir, with her weak heart and dropsy, Lady Beatrice couldn't get about with Sir Robert, but he spent two hours with her most evenings. But now, he never goes near her. And she's brooding. And drinking like a fish. Hmm. Did she drink before? A glass, perhaps. But now, according to the butler, it is often a bottle. Hmm. And then... What is Master doing down at the old church crypt at night? And who's the man he meets there? You'll get more and more interesting, Mr. Mason. Go on. It was the butler saw him go. So next night I was up, and sure enough, he was off again. And you followed him? Yes, although I was shy of getting too near. Sir Robert is a terrible man with his fists if he gets started. But I marked him down all right. It was the haunted crypt he was making for. Haunted? Well, sir, there is an old ruined chapel in the park, and under it a crypt that has a bad name among us. It's a dark, damp, lonely place by day, but there are a few who have the nerve to go near it at night. But Master never feared anything in his life. You say there was another man there? Well, surely you have only to question him. He's not one of ours. Can you be sure? I saw him clearly in the moonlight, Mr. Holmes. Hey, you! What do you think you're up to? A mean dog who was away into the darkness as hard as he could lick it when he heard me. But no one I know. Who keeps Lady Beatrice company? Her maid, Carrie Evans. She's been with her these five years. And devoted, no doubt. She's devoted enough, but I won't say to whom. Ah. Uh, from Dr. Watson's description of Sir Robert, it is not difficult to imagine that women are not safe from it. <clears throat> Don't you think the quarrel between brother and sister may lie there? The scandal has been pretty clear for a long time. But perhaps not to Lady Beatrice. Well, let us suppose she suddenly finds it out. She wants to be rid of the girl. Her brother will not permit it, and the invalid has no means of enforcing her will. The hated maid is still tied to her. She refuses to speak. She takes to drink. Sir Robert, in his anger, takes her pet spaniel away from her. Does not all this hang together? It might do, as far as it goes. Exactly. As far as it goes. How would all that bear upon the visits by night to the old crypt? We can't fit that into our plot. No, sir. And there is something more to fit in. Why should Sir Robert want to dig up a dead body? Hmm? What? I only found it yesterday, after I had written to you. Sir Robert had gone to London, so I went down to the crypt. It was all in order, sir. Except that in one corner was a bit of a human body. Good Lord. Have you informed the police? I hardly think it would interest them, sir. It may have been a thousand years old. Oh. But it wasn't there before. That I'll swear. Well, what did you do? I just left it there. That was wise. Has Sir Robert returned yet? We expect him back today. When did he give away his sister's dog? A week ago. The creature was howling outside the old well house, and Sir Robert was in one of his tantrums that morning. I thought at first he would have killed it, but he called over one of the jockeys. Take this wretched dog to Barnes at the Green Dragon. I don't wish to see it ever again. I'm not yet clear, Mr. Mason, what you want me to do in this matter. Can't you make it more definite? Perhaps uh, this will make it more definite, Mr. Holmes. Our visitor took a paper from his pocket, unwrapped it carefully and exposed a charred fragment of bone. Where did you get this? There is a central heating furnace in the cellar under Lady Beatrice's room. It's been off for some time, but Sir Robert complained of cold and had it on again. One of my lads runs it and came to me with this, which he found when raking out the cinders. He didn't like the look of it. Well, nor do I. Uh, Watson. Hmm? Oh, well, there's no doubt it's the upper condyle of a human femur. Exactly. When does this lad attend to the furnace? He makes it up every evening and then leaves it. Then anyone could visit it during the night. Can you enter it from outside? There is one door from outside, 
and another which leads up by a stair to the passage in which Lady Beatrice's room is situated. These are deep waters, Mr. Mason. Deep and rather dirty. Yet Sir Robert was not at home last night, so whoever was burning bones, it was not he. Is there good fishing in your part of Berkshire? Uh, the trainer showed very clearly upon his face that he was convinced that yet another lunatic had come into his harassed life. Well, sir, I've heard there are trout in the mill stream and pike in the whole lake. That's good enough. Watson and I are famous fishermen, uh, are we not, Watson? What? Uh, uh, well, yeah, if, if you say so, Holmes... You may address us in future at the Green Dragon. We will arrive there tonight. Direct a note there if you need to talk to us, and I do not doubt I can find you if I want to. Uh, when we've gone a little further into the matter, I will let you have a considered opinion. Thus it was that a bright May evening found Holmes and I armed with a formidable litter of rods, reels and baskets on our way to Shoscombe. On reaching our destination, a short drive took us to an old-fashioned tavern where a sporting host, Josiah Barnes, entered eagerly into our plans for the extirpation of the fish in the neighbourhood. What about the whole lake and the chance of a pike? Oh, that wouldn't do, sir. You might chance to find yourself in the lake before you were through. Uh -huh. Well, how's that, then? It's Sir Robert, sir. Terrible jealous of touts. If you two strangers were as near his training quarters as that, he'd be after you as sure as fate. Now, we hear he has a horse entered for the derby. Yes, and a good colt, too. Mm. He carries all our money for the race, and all Sir Robert's into the bargain. Oh, uh, by the way, you aren't on the turf yourselves, are you? Oh, no, indeed, no. Just two weary Londoners who need some good Berkshire air. Well, <laughs> you're in the right place for that. There's a deal of it lying about. Mm -hmm. By the way, that was the most beautiful spaniel I saw in the hall. Oh, that's the real Shoska breed. There ain't a better in England. What, if you don't mind me asking, would a prize dog like that cost? Oh, more than I could pay, sir. It was Sir Robert himself who gave me this one. That's why I have to keep him on the lead. <laughs> He'd be off to the hall in a jiffy otherwise. Now, uh, mind what I told you. Keep clear of the park. Mm. Well, Watson? Oh, friendly enough, chap. Yes. And we are getting some cards in our hand. But we still need to find a time to enter the sacred domain without fear of bodily assault from Sir Robert. Uh, is that to look for something specific? Mm, there are just one or two points on which I should like reassurance. You have a theory, then? Only that something happened a week or so ago which has cut deep into the life of the Shoscombe household. Oh, but what is that something? Well, we can only guess at it from its effects. They seem to be of a curiously mixed nature. But that should surely help us. It is only the colourless, uneventful case which is hopeless. Consider our data. The brother no longer visits the sister. He gives away her dog. Her dog, Watson. Does that suggest nothing to you? Mm -hmm. Nothing but the brother's spite. Well, it might be so. Or, well, there is an alternative. Now, review the situation from the time of the quarrel if there were a quarrel. But the lady keeps her room. And alters her habits, refuses to stop at the stables, and apparently takes to drink. Uh, that covers the case, does it not? Save for the business in the crypt. But that is another line of thought. There are two, and I beg you not to tangle them. Line A, which concerns Lady Beatrice, has a vaguely sinister flavour, don't you think? Mm, I, I can make nothing of it, sir. Uh, well, now, let us take up line B, which concerns Sir Robert. Mm -hmm. He is mad keen upon winning the derby, but may at any moment be sold up and his racing stables seized by his creditors. Yes. He is a daring and desperate man. Mm -hmm. He derives his income from his sister. His sister's maid is his willing too. So far, we seem to be on fairly safe ground, do we not? Yeah, but the crypt... Ah, ah yes, the, the crypt. Well, let us suppose, Watson, and it is merely a scandalous hypothesis put forward for argument's sake, that Sir Robert has done away with his sister. Oh, no, my dear Holmes, it's out of the question. Sir Robert is a man of honourable stock. You do occasionally find a carrion crow among the eagles. Mm. Let us for a moment argue that supposition. What would he do? Fly the country. But that would avail him nothing until he had realised his fortune. Ah, and that could not be done until Shoscombe Prince has won his race. So he must stand his ground. Hmm. But there would be a body. He must dispose of it and find a substitute to impersonate her. I suppose, with the maid as his confidant, that would not be impossible. The woman's body might be conveyed to the crypt, as it is so seldom visited, and then secretly destroyed in the furnace. 
Yes, well, it's at all possible, but only if you grant the original monstrous supposition. Mm. There's a small experiment we may try tomorrow. Meanwhile, if we are to keep up our characters, I suggest we have our host in for a glass of his own wine mm-hmm. and hold some high converse upon eels and dates. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in the process, we may chance upon some useful local gossip. Yes. In the morning, Holmes discovered we had come without our spoon bait for Jack, which absolved us from fishing for the day. About eleven o'clock, we started for a walk and he obtained leave to take the black spaniel with us. After about twenty minutes, we had come to two high park gates, with heraldic griffins towering above them. This is the place. Now, about midday, Mr. Barnes informs me, the old lady takes a drive, and the carriage must slow down as the gates are opened. When it comes through, and before it gathers speed, I want you to stop the coachman with some question. Mm-hmm. What will you be doing? Oh, never mind me. Uh, we shall be behind this Hollywood. Come on, come on. It was not a long vigil. We soon saw the big open yellow barouche coming down the long avenue with two splendid high-stepping horses in the shafts. Holmes crouched behind his bush with the dog. I stood unconcernedly swinging a cane in the roadway. A keeper ran out and the gates were opened. The carriage had slowed to a walk, and I was able to get a good look at the occupants. A highly coloured young woman with flaxen hair and impudent eyes sat on the left. At her right was an elderly person with rounded back and a huddle of shawls about her face and shoulders. As the horses reached the high road, I held up my hand with an authoritative gesture. I say, I say, just a moment. Oh, can you tell me if Sir Robert is at Trostham at present? What do you know here? With a joyous cry, the spaniel Holmes had released, dashed forward to the carriage and sprang upon the step. Then, in a moment, its eager greeting changed to curious rage, and it snapped at the black skirt above it. Drive on! Drive on! Get up there! Watson, Watson, hold yes. the dog! The one I get the right, lead on! Right, right, right. Well, good dog, good dog. Mm. That's done. Mm. He thought it was his mistress and he found it was a stranger. Mm. Dogs don't make mistakes. Oh, it, it was a man's voice. Exactly. We've added another card to our hand, Watson, but it needs careful playing all the same. My companion had no further plans for the day, so we did actually use our fishing tackle in the mill stream and had a dish of trout for our supper as a result. But in the evening, we took the same road as in the morning. A tall figure was waiting for us at the gates. John Mason, the trainer. Uh, Good evening, gentlemen. I got your note, Mr. Holmes. Sir Robert has not returned yet, but he's expected later tonight. How far is this crypt from the house? A good quarter of a mile. Then I think we can disregard him altogether. I can't afford to do that, Mr. Holmes. The moment he arrives, he'll want to see me to get the latest news of Shaskam Prince. I see. Mm. Well, in that case, we must work without you, Mr. Mason. You can show us the crypt and then leave us. It was pitch dark and without a moon. Mason led us across the park until a dark mass loomed up in front of us. This is the chapel. The entrance is on the far side. Once inside, we picked our way across heaps of loose masonry to the corner of the building, where a steep stair led down into the crypt. A match, Mr. Mason, if you will, while I light my lantern. Uh, Sure. It was a melancholy place, dismal and evil-smelling, with ancient crumbling walls and piles of coffins, some of lead and some of stone, extending upon one side right up to the arched roof. The light from Holmes's lantern was reflected back from the coffin plates, many of them adorned with the griffin and coronet of this old family, which carried its honours even to the gate of death. You uh, spoke of some bones, Mr. Mason. Sir. Could you show them to us before you go? They're uh, here, in this corner. But, oh, they're gone. What? Gone? As I expected. I fancy the ashes of them might even now be found in the oven from which your lad extracted the remains of that bone. But why in the world would anyone want to burn the bones of someone who has been dead hundreds of years? That is what we're here to find out. It may mean a long search, and we need not detain you. I fancy we shall get our solution before morning. 
When Mason had left us, Holmes set to work making a very careful examination of the graves. They ranged from a very ancient one, which appeared to be Saxon, through a long line of Norman Hugos and Odos, until we reached the Sir William and Sir Dennis Falder of the 18th century. It was an hour or more before Holmes came to a leaden coffin standing on end. Now, now, this looks more likely. With his lens, he examined the edges of the heavy lid eagerly. Then he drew from his pocket a short jemmy, which he thrust into a chink, levering back the whole front. But as we started to move the lid, we had an unforeseen interruption. Quiet. There's someone in the chapel. And coming towards the crypt, as so it seems. An instant later, the man we had heard was framed in the Gothic doorway. He was a terrible figure, huge in stature and fierce in manner. A large stable lantern, which he held in one hand, shone upwards upon a strong face and angry eyes. In the other hand was a heavy stick. Who the devil are you? Or what are you doing on my property? Do you hear me? Who are you? What are you doing here? I also have a question to ask you, Sir Robert. Who is this? And what is it doing here? Holmes turned and tore open the coffin lid behind him. In the glare of the lantern, I saw a body swathed in a sheet from head to foot with dreadful, witch-like features. The dim, glazed eyes staring from a discoloured and grumbling face. How came you to know of this? And what business is it of yours? My name is Sherlock Holmes. Ah, I see. And my business is that of every other good citizen, to uphold the law. It seems to me you have much to answer for. Well, Mr. Holmes, appearances are against me, I'll admit. But I could act no otherwise. I should be happy to think so. But I fear your explanations must be for the police. Well, if they must, they must. Come up to the house and you can judge for yourself how the matter stands. When we were installed in the gun room of the old house, Sir Robert left us, returning shortly afterwards with two companions. One was the florid young woman we had seen in the carriage. The other was a small rat-faced man. Uh, these are Mr. and Mrs. Norlet. Oh, the couple both began to talk at once. <clears throat> but were quickly silenced by a fierce glance from Sir Robert. Mrs. Norlett, under her maiden name of Evans, had for some years been my sister's maid. She can therefore substantiate what you say. That is correct. Now you have clearly gone pretty deeply into my affairs, Mr. Holmes, or I should not have found you where I did. I know that the success of your horse in the Derby is your only salvation. That is correct. Also that your sister, Lady Beatrice, had only a life interest in the estate. If she were to die, your creditors could be expected to descend on you. Like a flock of vultures. Particularly as the chief amongst them is a man I was once compelled to horse with on Newmarket Heath. <laughs> well, Mr. Holmes, my sister did die just a week ago. And you told no one? How could I? I faced absolute ruin. But if I could stave things off for three weeks, all would be well. So you arranged for this man, Nora, to personate your sister? It was not difficult to arrange. But the body could not remain where it was. So you carried it first to the old well house? But your sister's pet spaniel kept watch at the door. Hmm. It is beyond me how you know that, but... Yes, I got rid of the dog, and Norlitz and I carried the body to the crypt. Sir Robert, your conduct seems to me inexcusable. Yes, yes, I agree. There was no indignity or irreverence. It seemed to me there would be no unworthy resting place if we put her for a time in one of the coffins of her husband's ancestors, lying in what, after all, is still consecrated ground. But to do that, you had to dispose of some remains. Yes. Norley came down to burn them each night in the central furnace. Well, Sir Robert, this matter must be referred to the police. Mm. I have brought the facts to light, and there I will leave it. It's nearly midnight, and high time we made our way back to the Green Dragon. Don't you agree, Watson? Yes, yes. I learned later that the police and coroner had taken a lenient view of the incident. Beyond a mild censure for the delay in registering the lady's decease, Sir Robert got away unscathed. As Shoscombe Prince has indeed won the derby, Sir Robert will also be able to re-establish himself in a fair position in life. And, um... <clears throat> Uh, one or two others have benefited as well. Of course I'd be delighted to have you buy me dinner at Simpson's, Watson. Uh, but what are we celebrating? Uh, well, I discovered that they were still offering odds of 40 to 1 on Shoscombe Prince, and so I... Uh, <laughs> I naturally... Uh... Oh, my dear Watson, you have an infinite capacity to surprise me. Uh -huh. mm. Well, I'll just go and get my coats. Yeah. <laughs> In Shoscombe Old Place by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Roy Marsden played Sherlock Holmes, 
John Moffat, Dr. Watson, Sean Barrett, John Mason, Jack May, Sir Robert Norberton, and Peter Tuttenham, Josiah Barnes. The music was written by Joss Sanglier and played by Joss Sanglier and Elizabeth Fellows. Shoscombe Old Place was dramatised by Grant Eustace and directed by Michael Bartlett for Daedalus Productions. <laughs>